Hello, uh, my name is Filippo. I'm a theoretical physicist, and together with uh, Jochen, Elliot, and Jenny, uh, we'll talk about our research projects. I work with um, quantum mechanics, and as you may have heard, uh, some strange or weird things happen uh, in quantum mechanical systems. Um, and today I'm going to talk about one of these uh, facts. Uh, it's known as uh, quantum entanglement. And to picture it, uh, imagine to have two boxes uh, with an unknown content. Uh, now, what you know is that the content of the first box is related to the content of the second box, and that uh, the content is um, a quantum mechanical system. Now, suppose you keep a box and you send the other one uh, very far away. Uh, say to the other part of the galaxy, to some alien that will help uh, with the experiment. Um, for the laws of quantum mechanics, uh, the distance is not really important. So you can think about the boxes as being uh, close together. Um, in the boxes, there are uh, a light bulb, and uh, either the scientist on the right or the alien can light the light bulb when they want, and so they can look inside the box and see uh, what's the object. Um, now, for the rules of quantum mechanics, um, you can consider all the possible objects that can be in the boxes as being there together at the same time. So suppose you can uh, see what's happening inside the boxes. Um, there are pairs of objects that are floating in and out. And at any point, uh, the, either the alien or the, um, the scientist can uh, light the light bulb, look inside, and select, randomly select one of these objects. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the scientist, for example, can get a mousetrap, a uh, uh, mushroom, a dog, a pizza slice, or a telephone. So suppose he looks inside and gets the dog. Uh, then the alien will have a 100% probability of finding the hat. Um, and this is weird because um, the action in one box determines a probability in the second box. And this happens regardless of distance and instantaneously. So now suppose the alien uh, lights the light bulb and looks inside this box. Um, he gets the zombie. Now the zombie was related to the pizza slice. So in the second box, uh, the, uh, even though uh, the scientists haven't looked inside yet, uh, he has a 100% probability of finding the pizza. And re remember, this happens regardless the distance, as you can see. Uh, now, the, the scientist lights his light bulb, sees the, uh, notices that he has the pizza, and he instantaneously knows that uh, the alien had the zombie. Now, even though I'm uh, working on this, I'm not having boxes that contain zombies or dancing elephants or uh, uh, pizza slices or telephones or big mushrooms. Um, this is a, a, um, a clever way of thinking what is happening. And in physics in general, uh, we always do that. We always uh, build models of, of reality. For example, is this how an atom really looks? You have seen these pictures many times in your textbooks. And here you can see an uh, um, uh, an electron jumping from two energy levels, and by doing so, he loses some energy, and this energy is emitted as light as a photon. But actually, even if you take the, the most simple of all atoms, the hydrogen atom, uh, this is how it really looks like. In these boxes, you can see uh, various configurations of uh, the position of the electron, depending on how much energy the atom is storing, if it's spinning on itself, if there is a magnetic um, field acting upon it, uh, so, if you really want to picture it in your mind, you should think about this, and you should think about the superposition of all these boxes, to be precise. So, why try so hard to imagine how an, uh, how an atom really looks? Is this worth it? Well, if you study m more uh, carefully the subject, um, you may notice that each box has a very definite energy level. So you could just draw a line per energy level, perhaps in a, 
as concentric circles. And well, this is what we do. Uh, the, the famous picture about uh, atoms is uh, uh, an image that um, reflects the energy levels that uh, correspond to the boxes on the picture on the right. And in general, physics simplifies reality. Uh, so if you think about gravity, you think about um, spheres uh, and, and, um, and arrows, or if you think about thermodynamics, uh, you think about uh, pistons and gases and forces, or if you think about, uh, if, if you want to think about um, um, electromagnetic waves, uh, you talk about uh, waves and vectors. And if you want to think about atoms, well, the most intelligent way to think about it is with energy levels, either drawn like concentric circles or like lines, one above each other. Now I will uh, give the word to Jochen that will tell you about what we can do with this model. Hello, my name is Jochen. In contrast to Filippo, I'm an experimental physicist. And I'm talking to you about what I'm doing in my research. Filippo talked to you about energy levels of a single atom, which you see on the top of the slide. But what happens now if you look at a bunch of atoms which you have in a solid? If you look at the right corner, lower right, right corner, you see energy bands with gaps in between. That's also a simple way to look at it instead of orbitals. Now let's look at a specific kind of solid, a semiconductor. On the left side, you have the energy levels, the energy bands with the, with the gap. If an electron moves along in the upper band, which is called the conduction band, it spontaneously can drop down to the lower, la to the lower level and thereby emit light. The color of the light depends on the size of the gap. One device which utilizes this behavior is the light emitting diode, or the LED. You probably know them in your TVs as status indicator. But what other applications are there? For example, traffic lights, headlights of cars, or even more importantly now, room lighting. And this field is called solid state lighting. But why talk about solid state lighting? Around 20% of Earth's total power consumption goes into lighting. So, it's, so if you think about the future and the upcoming energy crisis, it's worth, worth thinking about how to save part of those energy. And there's where solid state lighting comes in. But first, we have to look at the evolution of lighting to see where the LED comes in. The top, the light bulb, was invented about 150 years ago. Electricity passes through, through a wire and it glows. But around 90% of the energy used goes into heat and therefore the light bulb is very inefficient. Next, fluorescent, fluorescent lamps were invented. They are a little better and efficient efficiency, but they contain toxic materials. And there my research comes in. I'm working on LEDs, specifically white LEDs. They are very efficient. Around 90% of the spent energy is transformed into light, and they have very long lifetimes, up to tens of thousands of hours. But as I mentioned, talking about solid state lighting, lighting in kind of room lighting, you need white light. And that's what Elliot is talking to you about now. Thank you, Jochen. OK, as you mentioned, we need to convert our LED emission into white light. But what is white light? White light is a combination of red, green, and blue. You merge the three, and you get white light. So. How do we go about this? 
well, my project is looking at polymers. Let's start off with what is a polymer. A polymer is a large molecule comprised of repeating structural units. Now we can vary these structural units to get different properties out of the polymer. You can have lightweight flexible ones such as in flip-flops, hard ones for water tubing, insulating flexible ones for cabling. Another property you can vary is the light emission when you shine UV upon it. So we take a red, green and blue polymer blend and my project involves inkjet printing of this blend onto the UV emitting LEDs. It's a very quick, very cheap processing tool and through that we can achieve high energy conversion of white light sources. Another application of this technology is to separately print the red, green and blue inks so to get pixels such as you may see in monitors and TVs. An advantage of the inkjet printing process is that you get a size, a resolution of 50 microns which is about the diameter of a human hair and using this enhanced resolution we can shrink the dimensions of say a 32 inch TV as you can see top down two and a half times so we get a very effective size compression of the technology. Now I will pass you on to Jenny who will talk about light absorption. Hi, my name is Jenny and Elliot and Jochen have both spoken to you about light emission and what I'm going to talk to you about is light absorption. So if you look at the top picture on the screen, that is the earth emitting light during the night. However, the bottom picture is the earth reflecting light during the day and it is this reflection amongst other things that my project looks at. Okay, so what do I do? I look at the optical properties of water and determine the amount of stuff and gain information on this stuff in the water. But what is in water? What is this stuff that I'm talking about? Well, there's water, obviously. Um, there's what we call yellow substance that's in water. Um, that's what makes it look murky and yellow sometimes. There is also sand and mud, mud and algae and other plant life. So how do we get this information? Well, what some people do is we can look at this information from satellites. We can gain information like the two pictures on the screen just now. The top one is a picture of sand and other mud swept up from the Gulf of Mexico. And the bottom picture is a algal, picture of an algal bloom taken just off the coast of New Zealand. However, what I do is I go on cruises and throw instruments into the water and get measurements that way um, to see how light is affected by the ocean. This gives us a measurement of the inherent optical properties. Inherent optical properties, or IOPs, are properties that are related only to the stuff that's in the water and they are not affected by the lighting conditions. So if you've got light coming in from the sun, some of the light is reflected back away from the ocean surface, some of it is absorbed by the ocean and the things in it, some of it is scattered away and some is completely unaffected. So in summary, physics does it all. Whether you're looking at quantum entanglement, LEDs, HDTVs, or even the oceans, physics looks at all of these things. Thank you very much for your attention.